Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Adrian. I work at Globo. We are just here, I'm, I don't know, over there around the corner. I don't know if you guys know Globo. We are uh, on demand service delivery. And so here I am today to talk a little bit about our trip, travel from that we experienced migrating our website from Angular to Vue. So here in the first row, we ha I have brought shamelessly half of the team of Globo. So if you have any questions afterwards, you can also ask them. But anyway, um, let's start, no? I think, yeah, everyone's here. Okay, so um, let's start my story by the beginning. I would say that I, I love to travel. love to travel a lot. I love to travel everywhere, anywhere, but what I like the most about the whole traveling experience is the preparation, you know, the, the planning. When you make a decision, <coughs> you read some reviews, you search for some flights, and you compare prices. So all those thrills and emotions of preparing a trip, that's, that's the best experience for me. So what I want to talk today, as I said at the very beginning, is our little trip that the web team is two of us, the two guys we took at GlobeUp. So there we are at the very beginning, uh, in our house, in our comfy sofa at home, enjoying the days passing, you know. Life is wonderful in our web team department. Uh, we use Angular. 1.6, always latest version, latest version. We work a little bit with CoffeeScript. We program using Puck, also previously known as Jade. We use a stylus to code all our CSS. And yeah, we do, you know, all these kind of trendy things. We use Gov, Pass to Manify, Clean, and put everything together. Uh, we use good practices, you know, everything is super nice, well, al almost everywhere because, you know, there's that special case that, eh, that doesn't work, well, okay, let's inline the CSS here, or, mm, yeah, that logic, instead of putting it here, let's put it over there, it will be easier, but, you know, uh, it doesn't matter, everything works, so let's go on with that. Uh, test, yeah, test, what are, what are those, yeah, I've heard about those, but, you know, it's super complicated to do them on a website, we don't have time, so yeah, everything works, let's go on. So yeah, life was beautiful, Was we were enjoying everything, but you know, you have this kind of feeling inside that mm, everything is so fragile, everything is kind of a mess. So one of those days we said at Globo, okay, maybe we should do something about that. And we decided to to move on to do a little bit, a little step forward. So after reading and researching a little bit, um, how can I make our app better? I stumbled upon a post from a guy who knows a little bit of Angular. It's he, he's called it's called he's called Todd Moto, and he was talking about Angular 1.5 components. So those components, if you don't know what what they are, you should like tomorrow we'll learn about those, but those components are little black boxes, or maybe not so black, that they encapsulate some a part of your website in a way that you can reuse them in different places. So you could think about, hey, I have this uh, product card and I put that inside the component, then I can reuse it uh, in multiple places in our website. So yeah, that looks fine. We read a little bit about those components in Angular 1.5. Yeah, it doesn't seem so difficult. So let's try them. On the plus side, uh, components forces, forces you to be more consistent, more structured, have a better architecture. So OK, let's go. We try with the small one. Everything is great. It works super easy. Looks nice, clean, great. So let's try something a little bit more complicated. And mm, the problems start to appear. Navigation is more complicated. Uh, we say, okay, if we do that, ah, fuck, you need to update your UI router library, and then everything else doesn't work, and the whole app crashes. 
and then in order to use components in your Angular application, then you need to use components everywhere. So yeah, that intention that we had of doing things a little bit better mm, kind of faded away. We said, yeah, yeah, let's take a look at it maybe later. So here we are again, like the very beginning. We are in our comfy sofa, but not so comfy anymore. We are not so enjoying life because, yeah, everything is okay. Everything is working in our website, but mm, we know that something is not completely right. When uh, our marketing teams comes and say, hey, yeah, there's some problems with SEO, CEO, whatever, SEO, with your Angular website, yes, and I have some articles prepared saying, yeah, yeah, there are certain difficulties with Angular, we'll fix that when we upgrade everything, so, okay, okay. So, that's the feeling, we're not offering our best experience to our users, you know, and it's something that we've built and it just works okay, not super, but just okay. So, in the other hand, if we want to make our application better, we will need to do a full rewrite. So, yeah, and that takes some time and some resources. So here we are, thinking, pondering where we are, where we want to go, and in the end we say, okay, for that we go all in. Let's rewrite everything and let's make our application better. So, interesting, there are very few it seems that there are very few frameworks around there to work nowadays. But yeah, no, let's be realistic. There's thousands of them. But we've narrowed them, we narrowed them to three. Guess what? Yeah, those three in the back uh, were the main candidates. Why? Because we wanted something realistic, something powerful, something uh, mature that could work uh, in a big, big application. So our candidates, as you know, are Angular, Angular 2, or Angular right now, just plain, plain Angular. We have also React.js, and then we have this view new challenger. So Angular is, we could say, was the logical successor. You know, we, after all, we've been using Angular in our application. Maybe a lot of you are using Angular 1.5 or 1.x, so it seems like the right move, no? Like it would be just an upgrade. Uh, then you have React. React, you might not have heard about it, but it seems that it's a pretty solid option nowadays. So yeah, it's a candidate. And then you have Vue, this new challenger that is top trending uh, in the past months. Like it's gaining more and more traction. So yeah, it must be doing something right. So. There we were, we sat down, and we started to look into all of them, and we decided to make a first decision. And the first decision was, I'm sorry, Angular, uh, we cannot trust you anymore. That would be, this headline would be the too long didn't read, or the headline of what we are going to discuss uh, next. So on paper, Angular looked uh, the ideal solution. As I said before, uh, we were using Angular 1.x, it should be as an easy upgrade, a few tweaks here and there, and you know, we should be ready to go. But no, so even if you can migrate from one Angular 1.x to Angular 2.0, it's not so easy, you have to use some libraries, you can achieve that, but before you have to rewrite all your, every, all your application using components, and then even if you manage to do this kind of migration, everything is kind of a mess, it works, yes, but nah, you need a full rewrite. So on top of that, uh, we had this kind of feeling that it was not so stable. That's completely arguable and we can discuss that. But yeah, there were so many changes, you know, between the alphas, betas, there was that big change between Angular 1.0 and 1.5 and Angular 2.0 that we didn't find it quite stable, that we didn't trust it. And finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the instrumental complexity of Angular. So the, this instrumental complexity, well, it's a term that was talking about um, 
that we can talk about, like you have two kind of complexities in your application. We could say that you have the application complexity, that's the complexity that you it will require depending on your business logic. Like, is your app just going to display some images or just do some basic stuff? Or is your app going to retrieve a location based on that retrieve certain uh, items and then send the position? You know, there's a complexity that it's implied inside your application. And then you have the complexity of your framework, of the instrument that you work with. So it's not the same thing to just display a list in Angular than to display a list in React and display a list in Vue. So you have to kind of find a balance between those two. If in your application right now, the complexity of your framework is so much high, is higher than the complexity of your application, you are overking, and vice versa, if it's not good enough, you might find a lot of difficulties to achieve certain results. So for our taste, Angular 2.0 had a lot of instrumental complexity for what we needed. It was too complex to start doing the things that we needed. So that was the first decision. I'm sorry, Angular, we are dropping you. <coughs> so then we have React versus Vue, a headline that you've never seen or you've never read anywhere. And I'm not going to repeat all the analysis done by more older qualified than I people. Let's, you know, there's tons of comparisons. But let's just say that surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, those two frameworks are most similar that you could think of. So both of them are powerful and quick. You have a bunch of benchmarks out there, and yeah, both of them are pretty similar. Uh, both of them, I'm going to skip the next point, both of, first, both of them are user virtual DOM abstractions, and they provide those reactive and composable view components. So with they use both of, both of them use the same architecture, but Opal view claims that their option is quite better. It performs, outperforms React in every aspect. So there's that, but anyway, both of them use virtual DOM abstractions. And then we have these progressive frameworks. So both of them are progressive frameworks. What does that mean? Uh, initially, if you take just React JS and Vue JS, those are and that's another discussion, they could be called just plain libraries. They have a purpose that would be related to the view layer, but their functionality can be uh, extended, they can, it can be scaled up. So you have your Vue.js application, your React.js application, and you can add some routing to it using view router or react router. You can add some state management using uh, third party libraries. You can use Vuex, that's a similar to Flux, or you can use Review, that's the, the, the equivalent to Redux options. So that's a very cool thing about React and Vue. Angular, right away, it comes with all of that. And you want it or not, you need it or not, you are tied with a router. And, and some state management. So maybe you don't need that. So that's a cool thing. With Vue and React, you can start small and scale things up as you need them. And that's different, but not so different. The templating system is different. React uses DSX, and Vue uses plain HTML. Although, and not a lot of people, if you love for <coughs> any reason, strange reason, to code in DSX, you can do that also in Vue. So, yeah, it was a hard decision at that moment. And we were discussing a lot, and yeah, you can guess what we chose Vue. So I would say main three reasons that why we chose Vue. The first one is, yeah, slightly better performance. Yeah, not, it's not very important, of course, both of them are very similar, but hey, it's better, so better is better, yeah, that's one reason, yeah. Okay. So the second one is Vue's companion libraries. We were looking at them, and although React had tons and tons of third-party libraries, 
the main core libraries of Vue that are routing, state management, and templating are official. By, by saying official, I mean that they are coded and maintained by the same creator of Vue.js. So you have kind of a same progression between those main core libraries and the and Vue development. While in React, there's all, all those extra functionalities are done by third parties. So yeah, that can be a good thing, but also it can be a very bad thing. Sometimes I remember some flux, reflux drama, and there's, no, there's that. But the most important one uh, is the templating system and the learning curve. So I'm not kidding when, I was, when I'm saying that this last point is the most important one. JS, JSX is great and very powerful. Like I don't argue that, you know. But the, here I don't know if, if you can see that very much. But those are two ways to implement uh, an iteration plus uh, an if else. Uh, one in in JSX and one in in plain HTML in view. So yeah, it's super great, super powerful. But for me and for us as a, as a team. Uh, needing those 20 lines to just display an if and else or 40 to display a loop was kind of just not feeling right. There was too much complexity to that. With Vue, everything is plain HTML. It's very simple. You have those directives, you have the if, the else, the for, on clicks, whatever, this kind of stuff. And any person, and I mean any person of our team, that knows HTML, they can read, they can understand our code, they can help us. If you have interns in your company or you plan to have, you plan to hire some junior developers, super easy, you just need to know JavaScript, you just need to know HTML. The onboarding into Vue.js is super quick. The learning curve is super soft and gentle, trust me. Like, if you haven't tried, I don't know if a lot of you have tried Vue, but just try it. Uh, you will fall in love with it. Super, super, super easy. So uh, there we were. We chose uh, view, and we said, "Okay, so let's uh, start with the migration." No, <coughs> and let's just start by the beginning. If you have a very little app, uh, you can start using view, like just importing the view script, and that's it. Nothing else. But if you are going to make a big application that a lot of things are going to get involved, uh, then things get mm, nasty. So Vue provides and recommends a command line interface that is called Vue Cli. So just do it if you want to, to develop with Vue. Seriously, just do it. What does Vue Cli provides you? It provides you right away a webpack. Com uh, it uses webpack, webpack under the hood, and it provides you a webpack configuration out of the box, very simple, and and a very effective way to use Vue templates, ES, ES6 um, specifications with any kind of effort. Everything, all the imports, all the parsing templates, everything is already done and defined. We have a hot reload that is completely amazing. This hot reload um, that swaps components um, is kind of a live reload that you know you make a change in your code and automatically you see the result. So another stuff that it comes with ESLint. ESLint is a tool that checks how well you write your code, your JavaScript code. Well, JavaScript, yeah, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML if you want to, basically JavaScript. And the thing is that it forces you to write code in the right way, following some standards. And what I mean that it forces you is like, if you don't write it the correct way, it just crashes, you cannot continue. Of course, you can disable that, but it's super recommended, so, yeah, you will become crazy with all those alerts about extra spaces, indentations, giving you the you know the huge to kill you yourself every time that you forgot about you know a trailing space at the very end of a line. But you know, 
after using ESLint, our code is super structured. It follows the same pattern, the same standards, and yeah, you, you get that. Um, and finally, also testing. I will come back a little bit later about that, but it gives you testing out of the box, everything configured. You don't have to worry about any kind of configuration. You can start writing tests right away. But, and there's always a but, uh, there's some cons with that. The first one is that view, I view, Webpack is complex. No, it's way more complex than Gulp. If you guys have <laughs> tried both of them, like, out of the box, Webpack is great. You start touching some stuff. You say, hey, no, I want to also compile this kind of stuff. I want to import some external JavaScript. I want to add some SAS to CSS transforming code. There's a bunch of stuff. I want to change the folders. Then things stop working if you don't do things the right way. But literally, you don't know what, the, what is going on. So there's that. Also, in the whole view application, you can use ES6 imports and requires, and it works super well with NPM. But if you want to use some kind of another repo, another way of, I don't know, importing raw GS files or importing raw CSS, <laughs> that's where the fun begins. It starts working, there's some stuff that is not recognized. So there's that, the complexity that goes with Webpack. So, but yeah, it's worth it. Very, very, very worth it. Second thing, first component. So we started and we said, okay, let's start with the first component. And the first component is super easy. It's a few lines, and yeah, that seems super great, but in reality, there's a bunch more things going on in view. I don't know if you guys have touched that. It seems that's just the GS part, but I'm going to go further on on the next slide. But here is quite a summary of what you can see. Uh, you store all the properties, all the reactive variables inside the data part over there. So everything that is inside here, it will be reactive and will change if, like, it will change on the HTML part if if it's changed on the on the GS part on the GS part. There's some methods part over there where you can just define your methods. There's the computed part that is if you don't know yet computed is afterwards you will say, oh, okay, how could I live without those computed methods? If you guys know uh, Angular and Angular 1.5 actually, sometimes you need to display the value returned by a function. So you say, hey, I don't know, here display, or I don't know, some condition that has, that is inside the function. And that condition is evaluated in every digest cycle. So you, if, you, if you want to be curious and you just put a console log inside that condition, you will see that it's launched hundreds and hundreds of times every time it's reevaluated constantly in Angular. In Vue, you put this condition inside the computed uh, function, and it will only be triggered once one of the variables that they are inside that function changes. So, for example, if you have a computed function that says, hey, my name is plus this dot name, so it will only, that function will only be triggered when the property this dot name is actually changed. The rest of the time it will be not triggered. So that's super, for performance, is super great. Plus, you can import anything with yes 6 imports. Those are the imports. So basically, A, mm -hmm. hey, I need that component, so just import that from over there. You need lodash, you would just say, A, hey, import, that's a variable name that you give it from just lodash. And you don't, uh, and you don't need to actually say, say anything else because View will look into the npm folder and will find the lodash repo and will import lodash and you can start using it from directly from there. So you can define helpers. You can have some JavaScript file or some root file 
set at any place of your code, you just directly import that over there and bam, that's it, you can use it. And on top of that, if you import that in different components, uh, uh, Webpack will only import it once in your code. That's, that's the cool part. But for the guys who didn't see that before, so here you have your data bar, here you have your methods, uh, you have some computed there, and then those getters and setters, we will come to that afterwards, and here you can define some components that you are actually using inside that component, like nested components. Um, apart from that, we also do have um, this, you can touch the life cycle of a component. So you can access to the before creation, creation, before mounting, mounting, uh, uh, just before, before unmounting and unmounted, and before deleting and deleting part of the component. So you can do a bunch of stuff <coughs> pre and after rendering the component. Want to go back there? Sure. So you have that. That's a, that was a component, but the component that was just the JavaScript part. Actually, a view comes with its own template uh, managed by view loader. This this little guy. So you are not obliged to use them, but it's highly highly recommended. Basically. What it does, it adds in a single .view file uh, the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS part. Everything, bam, together. That way, you can define components, you can define uh, logic parts of your application in a single file. Everything is more, let's say, lean, more compact. Plus, on the plus side, you can define specific languages inside each one, each part of those. So here if we have our JavaScript or for example here you have so you say hey that part will be the style but I want to use stylus so you can start using a stylus but you can say hey I want to use SCSS so you can start using that or you can say hey I want to use SAS or I can just use CSS you could also work with that. The same thing here JavaScript here we're using plain JavaScript but you could say, hey, script, and I'm using lang, coffee script, type script, whatever you prefer. Uh, HTML part, you can use HTML, you can use PUC, you can use EGS, whatever you need. You just need to define here a tag saying lang equals that, and then in Webpack, you just need to import uh, the equivalent loader. So you just need to do npm install pack loader, and that will do. So that's super cool, and that's a full view component. So here is the .view file, and the whole thing would be a view component that you can move and you can import anywhere of your code in a very, very, very simple way. So that was the second stop. So we, we created our first component. Everything went well, very easy, very, very immediate. You don't have to learn a lot. You just put plain HTML, plain JavaScript, and plain CSS. So then we said, OK, now we need some routing. Uh, by the way, if you want to interrupt me at any point, you have any question, you want to see some code, you, anything, so don't hesitate. So this is some routing. We needed some routing. So the transition from using UI router or just plain Angular routing to view routing was surprisingly easy. Uh, you just need to be very organized and do things in a correct way. So basically, as our whole application is made of components and nested components, uh, routing is so easy that you just define a root and <laughs> what component will be rendered in that, in that group. The cool thing on top of that is that you can define children. So basically, if you define the root endpoint uh, inside one of those children, so for example, you have, um, I don't know, the registration page or the registration component, uh, it's inside your web app, um, main component or main content plus sidebar 
and here is the registration. You just have to define their child's one inside the other, and just in the final final component, you'll say, hey, when I uh, when I ping slash register, just load me that component that is the children of, of all of those components. So it will render all the components in sequential order and display yours. Uh, if you want, later on, I will show you some, some real examples. But super easy, super easy. You can pass properties, you can pass, you can control the routing part, so you can say, hey, before changing each route, do some logic, or before entering or actually changing, do some check and redirect to some other place. You could add a hook and say, hey, for any route, check if the, the user is authenticated, and if it's not, just redirect you to the login page, this kind of stuff. Super easy and, and super intuitive. Networking. Um, so we have HTTP, direct HTTP used in Angular. <coughs> and then in Vue, initially, and when I'm, say, I'm saying initially it was with Vue 1.0, uh, the official library for network calls was called Vue Resource. In fact, a, it was not developed by the Vue team, but by a third party that I don't remember the name. And with the launch of Vue 2, uh, the Vue team decided to remove it, not, not remove it, but remove it from the list of you know, official libraries, because official core libraries, because it was not developed by them. So they say, hey, it's okay, like you can continue using Vue Resource, but we don't support it officially. We will not, we will not be aligned with them in the terms of the development of the, of the Vue framework. So basically, you have hundreds of options. You can use whatever you want. You can use Vue Resource in any call, and this is the way that you make any call with, with Vue Resource. But you can use browsers, fetch API, or any library, in fact. You can just, as we saw with uh, ES6, you just import the library anywhere that you need that, and you just make the call. Uh, some libraries, like Axios and Fetch, you can actually find some wrappers around there, so they just wrap the library uh, with Vue, so you can use it anywhere, like, like a normal Vue component, and you just, you know, you put this, dot, whatever, and you don't need to import it, and any every time but basically now you can use whatever you want uh, in the documentation uh, view recommends you to use Axios they say hey, we are using Axios you can use whatever you want Axios is a very good library it has like 15,000 stars and it has anything that you would need promises whatever the only thing Axios is fine with that so the HTTP part, HTTP part, the network calls, super easy. You can do whatever you need. And then the important part, root scope. So in Angular, if something changes somewhere and you want to listen to that change, you basically have two options. Well, of course, I'm talking about something changes in some place, and you want to listen that to somewhere else, not like directly in the same component, the same uh, controller, this kind of stuff. No, so in a very separate place. So Angular, the normal way, Angular 1.x, uh, the way to do that, you could store the variable inside the root scope, but uh, as everyone says. Uh, be careful with that, don't overpopulate your root scope. And you could also send events, like broadcast, emit, this kind of stuff. A bunch of, uh, and you could listen to those events anywhere that you wanted. In Vue, uh, inside the component, there's, you can, there's a very definite um, architecture and way to communicate between components. So basically, if you communicate, you can only communicate between a parent and its child. So a nested component inside that component. So imagine that you have your whole application, you have the main content, and you have one thing here, one thing there. So you can talk between the child and the parent. Super easy. From the child, you put just this dot init 
and it will and the parent will listen to that event with an on uh, on parameter on directive um, and then the parent sends or passes properties to the child with the props part there's an example over there of a simple counter provided super easy uh, those properties are reactive in one way. Those are one-way data bindings. So, parent can change uh, values. They will be reactive inside the child, the, the child. But if the child changes those properties, it will not be affected in, in the parent. It will be just local. If you want to change something globally, the child will send an event to the parent. The parent will change that variable, and all the childs will listen to that change. So yeah, uh, what if it's not a parent and child communication? So as I said before, in Angular, without components, events were global, so you could broadcast anywhere, the root, the root scope was shared across everything, everything was wonderful. You say, okay, let's use Angular 1.5 and fuck everything, like nothing was working. Um, there's a bunch of, you can search and there's a bunch of articles. Yeah, of course, there are many ways to actually work and actually make it work. But basically, Angular is 1.5 discourages you to say, hey, I'm changing something here and pass some events, listen to, to those kind of stuff. Because it's a correct way. But that's been solved in Angular 2.0. But for Angular 1.5, they just say, OK, yeah, let's not do that. With view, you have two options. So you have that component over there, and you have that other component in the other side. For example, you have, I don't know, you are adding a product to a cart, and you have a little cart on the very top right uh, of your page. So you have two options to actually make the little cart reactive. The first one, it's using a global event bus. Uh, event buses. Uh, finding event buses in view is very simple. You just define a new instance of view, and that view instance will be shared will be shared across all the components. So you just define a constant boost equals new uh, new view, and then inside that boost you can attach say okay bus dot emit bus on, and you will listen to everything. But that's not you can do that, but that's not the way it's meant to be. The way it's meant to be is those states, the motherfucking states. And we have a bunch of libraries to use them. VX, review, view stash, view freeze, uh, in a decreasing way of complexity, I would say that this list is done. Maybe the last, last two we could swap them. But this is where things get seri serious. So Vuex, Vuex, we decided to start using Vuex. Vuex uses a single tree state. What is that state? That state is, if you don't know, it's a single object that contains all your application level properties, you know, and serves as the only source of truth. So imagine that you have a tree, that tree is private, and no one can change it. No one, we're going to specify that. But you know, you have a big object with a bunch of properties, and no one can change them. So what happens if you want to listen to those properties? So if you list, need to listen to those properties, you will have getters that are, yeah. Um, yeah. Getters are not defined, but it would be in the, in the purple circle. So those getters, very similar to a Java getter. Uh, you, you, you are, it's just a definition that you're saying, hey, I want to get the value of that property. Those getters are reactive. So if at <laughs> some point in this state, that variable changes its value, everyone that is subscribed to a getter will receive that notification. We'll go in a deeper example just after that. Um, and will receive the new value. So I've said that properties cannot be changed. Uh, that's not true. It cannot be changed directly in the code, but they can be changed. If, if not, there would be no sense. But the only way to do that is through mutations, that little red circle. 
Those mutations are a very small piece of code um, that make the little change. So you have a, nothing else, like three lines of code. The recommended thing is that just make one change inside a mutation. So you should have a bunch of mutations, each one for one small change. So for example, it's, I don't know, the mutation of changing the name would be uh, the store dot, the state dot name equals new name. That's it, end of the mutation. Those mutations can only be called by the actions. So those actions, again, very simple, are just plain methods. It would be the equivalent of a setter in Java. So in your code, you will say, hey, call, change the name with that value. So that action is defined somewhere else that will say, OK, you've called me. I will call the mutation that will change the name with that property. And that's it. That's a, the cycle, the circle of life. You are in your code. You call an action that will change the value of a property through a mutation, and everyone that has a getter, we listen to that change. Let me show you a little bit of code so you see that. Uh, so we have here, this is the, this is not a part, but this is this little, this is this little thing, okay? So we have this component, and we say, yeah, great. We want to show this hyperlocal address. Okay, that's our address that the user is currently uh, is the is the user currently using. Okay, so that hyperlocal address will change over time. So how we are defining this is we say a hey, getter getter getter. Here we have a get that says, hey, I want to retrieve hyperlocal, okay? And then here we have mm, 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 this hyperlocal address. So here we're saying, hey, print me what hyperlocal address returns. Actually, this is like a function, so we could say this, but there's no need to actually put the into parentheses. So this will call this hyperlocal address function that is a computed, as I said before. And this defines, hey, I have that, so when I have hyperlocal and I do some sanity checks, but if I have that, just print me a pretty address that I, ha I have inside hyperlocal, hyperlocal. Say, okay, cool. So basically, in this state, you have a state. It's, you can decouple that state in modules, so you have the logic separated in multiple parts, so it, it doesn't get messy. So I'm saying, hey, my state, by the way, has some city settings and has an hyperlocal property. That hyperlocal property has a current address and a history. You say, okay, perfect. And I'm defining some getters. Those getters will be, you can do whatever you want here. You're saying, hey, for example, I will have the getter hyperlocal, but what I'm doing is, hey, if you are asking me hyperlocal, I will return you from the state the hyperlocal property. But you can go deeper and deeper. For example, you say, hey, city, hey, I will just want the cities. So every time that I call cities, I will retrieve the state, city settings, cities. You could do a bunch of things like filtering or using arrays or mapping some arrays, you can come up with whatever you want. So basically we have this getter that every time that the state changes, it will return the state hyperlocal. A little bit down there, we have our actions. We have the first one that we don't care about, and then we have, for example, this cool hyperlocal action that says, hey, set hyperlocal, I'm passing you an hyperlocal, and I will define a mutation that's, that I'm calling hyperlocal change. And the only thing that I do in that action is commit that mutation, is actually calling that mutation. Of course, this is a very simple action. You can have some actions that iterate and filter some data. There's some actions that can actually 
uh, make call. This is a, a network call to our backend and then filter in the results. So you can do a bunch of stuff in the mutation. So here we are calling commit our mutation, and our mutation is defined here. Uh, no, not here. Here. And the mutation, as I said before, is just two lines of code, a state dot hyperlocal equals hyperlocal. So basically, when I'm calling, and the place where I call that mutation is here. So in my in my pop-up, when I do some stuff, and in the end I finish, and I retrieve a new sorry about that, and I retrieve a new address. I cannot scroll anymore. I know, I pressed the wrong one, sorry. So in my in my address, when I finish setting the address, here you're saying, hey, import the, the actions and the getters of my call state. And in that little small piece of code, you say, hey, from all the actions, I'm only interested in the set current address and the retrieve categories. Or, in the getters that are defined a little bit down there. Sorry. Here, in the getters, you say, hey, I'm only interested in cities, current city, and I for local. So, what happens here is this guy will say, hey, there's a new address that there's a new address, then it will call set the current address that this is an action that will call our actions, where, where are the actions again, that would call our action, that would set, that would call our action of setting a city, that will call a mutation, that would change the actual local value, and then in our front page, in, the, in our main page, as the actual local value has changed, we would receive the new value, and without touching anything, the address at the very top will change. So that's the whole cycle of a state management inside an application. Seems difficult, it is not. It is very powerful and it feels right. After you start using this, it feels completely right. This, you say, oh, fuck, that's the correct way to handle those changes and handle reactivity. So I'm nearly there at the very end. Um, during this trip, that we've done of going from Angular to Vue, we've battled and we've learned Webpack. We've, we've polished our coding style. It was a completely mess, and adding ESLint made us polishing everything. We've implemented ES6 features. We are using imports. We are using classes. We're using array, new array built-in functions. We are trying new HTTP libraries. We have redefined our strategy, our plans of routing, how it should work, you know, which component should be loaded when you ping a certain route. Um, this, but the most important thing is that we've started to think in terms of components and state. And the architecture of our app has evolved in consequence. So it doesn't matter, actually, if tomorrow if you, I will use Vue or React. In fact, uh, you can use Vue or React. It's, they are very similar. Both share the same stuff. All that I've shown here, all this Vue X, is the same thing in Flux. And Preview is very similar, and it's the same thing as Redux. So it's not about the tool that you're using, but the concepts that you are going to learn starting to use Vue and starting to use React. And these, those core concepts that <coughs> we've learned are now ours, and we'll be able to use them everywhere. And now, as I was saying, everything feels right. So, yeah, like it's not about the destination, you know? It's what we've learned across during this whole month, I would say, Fran, yeah, more or less one month we've been doing that. And yeah, that's that. You have a promo code that you can use in our app to get a free delivery. 
but basically that was more or less everything that I want to talk about in our process of learning view. The image I did that myself in Photoshop, so it's trademark it. I can pass it to you if you want. Uh, but yeah, questions or anything that you want to discuss. Everything is super subjective and of course it's not a hey, view is the best thing in the world and don't use React. Of course not. It's about what I wanted to say, learning those concepts and using Vue instead of React, you learn those concepts, I think, in a much easy way or nicer way than less complex, let's say that, than React. Questions I'll say over there? Yeah, sure. Thank you.